John chapter number 20. We're down verse number 11. I'm just going to get going here tonight. John chapter number 20. Uh, verse number 11, Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and saith two angels in white, sitting the one on the, on the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto, unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? And she said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know, know not where they have laid him. And when she had, had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. And, she said unto her, and Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom, seek ye, whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said unto her, Mary. And you notice there's a period after that. That's all he said. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Now that's the first appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ after his resurrection. John, I've tried to say to you as we've been in John 20, gives you evidences of the resurrection. He begins with the physical evidence of the scene. And he talks about that in the first ten verses. We've been over that in, at uh, some length. And John gives you the, the actual physical evidence that is uh, uh, the circumstantial evidence. Uh, you know, it's interesting that usually we think eyewitness evidence is better than circumstantial evidence. But it's been demonstrated time and again. You've seen the, the, the illustrations about how unreliable eyewitness evidence can be. I remember back in the 60s uh, in, in a uh, university class, uh, they, they did a demonstration. I was in the class, and, and they had, uh, we had a whole classroom of people sitting in a theater and in a lecture hall, and all of a sudden, uh, a couple of guys jumped up, ran down, and took some things and run out with it, you know, and, and, and robbed a, a couple of people in the place and just took off. And, and then after it was over with, the, the professor says, now, now, you know, we're going to have to call the police and all, so let's, and, and let's, let's get eyewitness accounts. And, you know, we got about six different descriptions of those two guys. And when the guys came back in after they, you know, told us they were fooling us, none of us were right. You know, see, some of them were kind of close, but none of it was correct. And you say, wow, that Sir Robert Anderson, who was the uh, uh, head of Scotland Yard at one time, the late 1800s, Christian writer, he was a barrister. He, he was an English lawyer who... Uh, Barris in England, you have solicitors and barristers, uh, one, one, one lawyer that does courtroom work, one that does paperwork, and we have those here. A lot of lawyers never get in the courtroom. They do, you know, they do uh, paperwork, uh, wills, estates, real estate, all that kind of stuff. Then you have some lawyers that are litigators. Well, he was a litigator, a prosecutor, and um, he, he said he would rather have good circumstantial evidence than eyewitness testimony, and he, he considered eyewitness testimony to be very unreliable unless it was corroborated by physical evidence. Because you never can be sure about the eyewitness. I was reading a thing recently about a, a, an accident uh, out west. A, uh, it was a, 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 a truck ran, over, ran into a car, and there were, it was 4 o'clock in the morning, and there were four eyewitnesses. And every eyewitness told exactly the same story. And so the investigator, he said, there's got to be something wrong. When did you ever see a, a wreck that had four witnesses, especially at four o'clock in the morning? One of them was a priest and, and, and a priest and two nuns and an army uh, army colonel. Right? First question is, what are you doing out four o'clock in the morning? You know, uh, but the second, how could you all have exactly the same testimony? And you know, it turned out that uh, there was a little bit of uh, hanky panky going on in the thing. And the thing that, that alerted the guy to it was the fact that all the, the, the eyewitness testimony was exactly, it was obviously rehearsed, in other words. And so he began to look at the circumstantial evidence, and the circumstantial evidence didn't bear it out. And so, so anyway, circumstantial evidence he corroborates, uh, confirms eyewitness testimony. And eyewitness testimony can explain circumstantial evidence uh, a, uh, kind of thing, but both together, one by themselves is, is not quite enough. You know, they just convicted that dude out in wherever it was for killing his wife out here, though. That guy's not, his name doesn't matter, but I, I can, he was, you know, he made a big, big heel of himself on the TV. And who was it? Yeah, that's it. 
convicted old Drew because of completely circumstantial evidence. And I'm listening to it, and I'm thinking, you know, boy, you got to be sure, you know, and you got to be sure about that. So, but circumstantial evidence can convict you. But if you've got circumstantial evidence and eyewitness testimony, then you've got the best of both worlds. And that's why Acts 1 says that he confirmed himself alive with many infallible proofs. He used both methods of confirming. Historical validity confirmed in the two fundamental ways of all, uh, uh, with the rules of authenticity. One is the circumstantial evidence bears witness to the fact that, the, that a miracle took place. And then the personal testimony of eyewitnesses who were familiar with, with what was going on, who had no ax to grind and no, nothing to gain by giving the testimony, confirm the, the, uh, uh, the, the, not just the reality of a miracle, but what the nature of the miracle was. And so this is, John is, is doing this, he does this more uh, thoroughly than any of the other Gospels. And he does it because he's demonstrating and making that point. He, he came into his own, his own received him not. But to as many as received him, gave he power to become the sons of God. And that power was based upon the power of the resurrection, the reality of the resurrection life. So we've gone through the ten verses with the circumstantial evidence. Now he's going to go through four accounts of personal eyewitness testimony that bears witness to the, to the living Christ and to the, the, the reality that we've seen him, he's there, he's risen, we've, we've identified him, we've examined it, and we know it's real. So you, you're going to have those kind of things. Now he doesn't just pick these out at random. The first person, it's fascinating, that Jesus appeared to in resurrection was Mary, was a woman. Not the twelve, not, not, of course, but eleven now. Not his, not his apostles, not, you know, not the, the religious, but, but a woman. And uh, she, she's a very special lady and a special, we'll see as we go through the thing. But before we get into that, I, I, there are fourteen times, fourteen, appearances of Christ after his resurrection in the scripture. This one is the first one, verse number uh, uh, fourteen. And 15 and 16, when he appears to Mary. Then the, the second one it comes over, if you come over to Matthew chapter 28, the first one and the fifth one, the sixth one and seventh one are in John. But the second one, he, after he appeared to Mary, if you come over to Matthew chapter 28, verse number 9, and as they went, and the they there is the women <laughs> that came to the tomb, <coughs> excuse me, as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held his feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid, go tell my brethren that they, that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. So the second appearance is to the other women, Mary and these other women came to the tomb. You recall that. Mary goes back to get Peter and, and, and John. Then Peter and John come to the tomb. We read all that in John. But it, it, and, and then afterwards, John and Peter go, go home and so forth. But then Mary lingers at the tomb here in John 20. And after she lingers in the tomb, she sees Jesus. He says, Mary, she recognizes him. Then he says to her in verse number, uh, John 20, verse number 17, Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto the Father, and to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So Mary, when he appears to Mary, he says, Don't touch me. Then a little while later, he appears to the women, the group of women, and he allows them to touch him. So these are two different occasions. Then if you come with me to Luke chapter number 24, Luke chapter 24, he appears to these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. That's on that Sunday afternoon. Now he appeared to Mary and the women on Sunday morning. They go and tell the disciples, the disciples don't believe them. Okay, so then the two right walking to, to Emmaus, he appears to them. He walks along with them. He's like the thing with Mary. Uh, he she sees him. She doesn't recognize him until he speaks to her. 
the, the two on the road to Damascus walk along with him. They don't know who he is. They don't recognize him until he reveals himself to him, and then, then they do. Verse 30, um, verse 29, then they, they constrained him and said, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them, and it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, and took, he took bread and blessed it and break, and break and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while, and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they arose and, uh, up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together, and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed. They've, we've seen him. So he appears to the road, two on the road to Emmaus, but keep reading verse 34. And notice that half, past tense, appeared to Simon. So after he appeared to the women, and before he appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus, he also appeared to Peter. So he had a personal private conversation with Peter. Then he meets with the two on the road to Emmaus. And so first, the first appearance is to Mary Magdalene, then to the women, then to Peter, then to the two on the road to Emmaus. Now come back to John 20. And the fifth appearance is in verse number 19. John 20, verse number 19. And he appears here to the ten, ten of the twelve apostles. Now, he appears to ten because Judas is dead. There aren't but eleven at the time. But Thomas isn't there. Thomas is unbelief. He said, I'm not going to believe unless I, I put my hands in. You know, I've I got, I got to be there and see, touch him, feel him. And Thomas isn't there. Verse 19. Then the same day at even, being the first day of the week, to the time markers. This is that Sunday night. When the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when, they had, when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. They realized it's true, and they're happy. They're, they're thrilled with it. He's there. That's the fifth appearance. Verse 24, the sixth one. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in, my, in his hands uh, the, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, now, now you're going to go another week now, a week now. Uh, and after eight days, again, his disciples were, were within, and Thomas with them this time. Then came Jesus, and, uh, came Jesus, the door being shut, and stood in the midst. It's fascinating on all the, you know, they got, they got the door locked, the windows nailed down. They're, in the, they're in, the, in, in the locked room hiding for fear of the Jews. Now, I don't know if you ever thought about what, the fear the, what, what, what did they fear from the Jews, but the best estimate I have about that is that uh, they, you know, the thing in Matthew 28, the Jews were spreading the word that the disciples came and stole his body. So evidently there, 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 there's some activity that way. It's got, got them, anyway, it got them scared. So the place is locked up. And he says to them, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believe. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. So he appears to Thomas, and that's the sixth appearance. Now if you come down to chapter 21, After these things Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. Now here's the, this is the seventh appearance, and it's to the seven, the, you count them here, there's seven disciples that he appears to. Then if you come back to Matthew 28, there's, uh, he appears to the eleven again in Galilee. Uh, the one in John 21 is by the, the, the uh, Tiberias, the, the sea, that's the Sea of Galilee. Matthew 28, verse 11, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed. Now they're not at the Sea of Galilee. Now they're up on a, they're up on a, on a mountaintop. 
And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now that's the, that's the, ele- the eighth time he's appeared. Now if you come over to chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, there are a couple of appearances that Paul mentions that are not found in the gospel accounts. First Corinthians chapter 15. There's a fascinating thing in, the, in Bible study where you, where you have, on occasions, you have things that, that are not found in, in the immediate context of, 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 a, of an event, but they are found in subsequent references. Uh, it, it's fascinating to go through the scripture and you read an account, and then you read way over, like in the book of Genesis, you read about Joseph being sold by his brethren into slavery. It's not till you come over to the book of Psalms that you read that his brother put him in irons, shackles, when they sold him into slavery. So you say, well, what is, what is, that's, that's a, a subsequent context, a subsequent reference. Moses goes into Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's magicians you know, he puts a snake down and it turns in, his rod down turns into a snake. And he had two magicians that duplicated that. You remember that story. It's in Second Timothy chapter 3 that you learn the names of those guys, Janus and Jamboree. That's not in Exodus. It's in Second Timothy. Obviously, everybody knew who it was because when Paul wrote it, they knew who it was a reference to. But your Bible does that. That's one of the fascinating things about Bible study. Is, is there's what we call truth from a remoter context. Everything isn't in the one page right here. That means if you just keep reading and keep studying, uh, you, you'll find things in, in Scripture scattered all over the Scripture. And it makes, it makes studying the Bible like a treasure hunt, you know, where you're, you're just finding uh, little jewels everywhere you go. Well, when you come to Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, he says in verse number 4, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scripture, and that he was seen. So Paul is going to give you the eyewitness testimony. He was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, we saw that in Luke 24, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of five hundred brethren at once. So after he was seen of the, uh, of the apostles, then he was seen of 500 brethren at once. Verse 7, after that he was seen of James. Then of all the apostles. So there you've got the ninth, tenth, and eleventh appearance. When he was seen of all the apostles, that would be in Acts chapter 1 at his ascension. Now, subsequent to that, twice he appears from heaven. One in Acts 7 to Stephen who sees him standing at the right hand of God in Acts 7. And then subsequent to that in Acts 9, verse number 8, he says, 1 Corinthians 15, 8, And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Now, that's the 13th appearance. Paul happens to be the 13th. <laughs> you know, people say, well, if Paul, was, he was, he's the 13th guy. He's not one of the twelve. He's the thirteenth apostle. He's the extra apostle, not one of the twelve. He's not thirteen because you don't add twelve and one and get get. He, you know, he's not added to the twelve, but um, it's thirteen. Thirteen, by the way, in the Bible is a number of rebellion. See, so he says before I was a blasphemer and injurious. Remember that. What is it that he, that Paul's ministry does? It reaches out and takes all the rebellious pagans out here, brings them in. Then there's a 14th appearance because after he appeared to Paul, and he appeared to Paul numerous times, there's one other person he appeared to. You remember who that is? The last book in the Bible. Who, was, who wrote that? John. John is transported into, into the future day of the Lord and sees the Lord and has visions and revelations of the Lord. Revelation chapter 1, verse number uh, 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and behold, behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, and then he uh, speaks, verse 11, verse number 12, and I turned to see the voice that spake unto me, and what does he see? He sees the Son of Man and the candlesticks. And so what he does, he sees the glorified Lord Jesus Christ as the, uh, as the Messiah of Israel. So 
Those 14 appearances are important in your scripture. John, in John 20 and 21, has four of them. Now it's fascinating, he takes the very first one, Mary, appearing to Mary. Now Mary was, you remember Mary Magdalene? She was the woman out of whom Jesus cast seven devils. Seven is a number of completion. She was completely in, 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 in bondage to Satan, in satanic captivity, completely, just like the nation Israel was. And what did he do? He set her free. What did he do the, to, to, the little, to the believing remnant when they trusted him? He came and he delivered them from satanic oppression, satanic bondage, and he set them free. And she's a representative, she's a picture of the little flock. The fact that she's a woman is, is very instructive because women, you know, 1 Peter 3 talks about the wife, not a, it's not, not talking about a woman, it's talking about a wife being a, the weaker vessel. Remember that verse? That's a, that's a verse that, you know, guys some kind of get, people sometimes get a little squirrely with. When it talks about a woman, the wife being the weaker vessel, it's not talking about the woman being, being physically or constitutionally or emotionally or mentally uh, weaker because in almost every one of those areas, she's not weaker. You know, may, maybe she can't pick up 300 pounds like some, you know, burly guy can, but there's a lot of guys can't pick up 300 pounds either. Um, she can have a baby. You try that, fellas, and you, and you, you know, just the thought of that makes me say, uh-uh, no, she, she, got my, she got my vote. What is talking about the wife being the weaker vessel is the wife is in the weaker position. She's, she's created to be the responder. The, man's the, the, the husband's the initiator, the wife is the responder. He's to be the head, she's to be in the submissive position. It's not, it has nothing to do with personal uh, attributes or character or the essence of who a, who, who a wife is. But in that responding position, in Scripture, Women are, are looked at with, with, with a great deal of, uh, of honor and, and respect. But, but all through Scripture, when God wants to point to human weakness and him working through human weakness, often he would point to a woman. He would have uh, Deborah judge Israel. That was a rebuke to Israel because he couldn't find a man to do the man's job. It's like he had the, uh, the left-handed dude, the, the, the judge. You, know, you go back to judges and you find all these weak, kind of odd, you know, the strong right arm doesn't do it, so God says, I'll just use this dude over here, this left-handed guy that you know, doesn't have much ability. But in, my, in, in, my, in, in your weakness, his strength is made perfect. So when you see the woman representing Israel, you see, and that's why the book of Isaiah talks about the virgin daughter of Israel. That's, that's a, des a description for the believing remnant in Israel. And that's Mary. She's one out of whom the Lord has delivered out of satanic captivity. And many times, over and over in the, in, in, in the Gospels, he'll take, he takes the woman with the issue of blood. He takes the woman and, and so forth. I didn't get, move on from that. But Mary, here's Mary. The first person he, he appears to represents that little flock the believing remnant of Israel to whom he is, is the, the, has captured their heart. He came into his own, his own received him not, but as many as received him. And there's Mary. There's that believing remnant. And what does he do? He appears to them. And he demonstrates his faithfulness to the believing remnant. The next appearing in John is when he appears that evening to the ten apostles. Now, you move from the first time he appeared, the woman, Peter, and the two on the road to Demaeus take place in between, and now you've moved to the fifth appearance. So John starts with the first one and then moves to the fifth one. And he moves over from the believing remnant to these unbelieving disciples. Here's, here's the, the rest of the little flock, but they're They've betrayed him. They've abandoned him. They're, they don't believe. Mary comes and says, he's arrived. They don't believe him. The other women come and say, he's alive. He's appeared. And they don't believe him. 
They're still in unbelief. Their faith is the weakest of all. But what does he do? He comes and he says, and I, you, you, you got to love it in verse 19. He stands in the midst and he says, peace be unto you. You know, he could have stood there and said, shame, shame, shame. For what you did. But he doesn't. He says, peace. You know, he says, guys, last time I talked to you, I said, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. And in spite of all that you did, all that you forsook me, my attitude toward you is still the same. Peace. And then he gives them power. He says peace again to them. Verse, verse 21. As my Father sent me, so send I you. Then he says receive the Holy Ghost. And he breathes on them. And then he commissions them again. With authority. To act in his absence. And you see his, 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 him restoring and sending out that little flock. What about Thomas? Well, that's the next appearance, the, the sixth appearance. By the way, six is the number of man. There's Tom in total unbelief. If I can't put my hands in, his, in, 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 in where the nails were and in his side, and so what does he do? He comes and he says, here, Tom, stick your hand in. Put your hand in my side. Thrust it in. Don't just put it, thrust it in. And Thomas is a picture of that future believing remnant, that future Israel who, Zechariah 12, 10 says, they shall look upon me whom they've pierced and mourn. Remember that verse? And that's Thomas. And then, then you move to the last time, the, the seventh one, in chapter 21, those seven disciples and I love the way he says it in verse, verse 1, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. Here comes it. He's coming again. And what you have here is a picture of his second coming, his taking his disciples, going out on the Sea of Tiberias. The Sea of Galilee has a bunch of different names in Scripture. Tiberius is the name of, is the Gentile name. He's the ruler. He's the Caesar. And he goes out on the sea. Revelation 17, the sea is a picture of the Gentile nations. And they go out and they do what that parable in Matthew, Matthew 13 is, is they have that, they, that, that net that comes in and they bring in the harvest from among the nations. And he brings them. We got a wonderful song. We, we don't ever sing it because it's not our our revised songbook. But down south they used to sing a song, Come and Dine, the Master Calleth, Come and Dine. You can sit at Jesus' table, you can feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. He invites the uh, hungry sinner, Come and Dine. You ever sing that? No. John sung it. See, he, he was raised in the right kind of environment. <laughs> but that, that comes out of that, Come and Dine. He's only... And he invites them to come in and to sit at his table and sup with him in his king. So you, have a, you, you, you get a dispensational picture all through here. One, you see his faithfulness to the believing remnant. You see him restore the little flock. You see Israel in the last days converted. And then you see converted Israel go out among the Gentiles and gather in the harvest. So what you're, here, what you're seeing here is not just the physical evidence and the personal eyewitness testimony. John selects out the first, the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh appearances in order to portray to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Now that issue about being sons, that's an issue of adoption out of Egypt, if I call my firstborn son, to be able to be, to be completely and fully engaged with the Father in his purpose and plan for the nation Israel. And that begins with the little flock. And you'll see all of that uh, kind of stuff here with Mary. So we've got 17 minutes now to go through all that. Okay. I'm going to tell you now, we ain't going to make it. <laughs> but uh, that's enough. I, I give you that introduction. If you keep that in your mind as we go through these things, you can kind of see. In, in the book of John, it's important to just kind of get the, get the lay of the land like that constantly. 
Because as John writes, he, he's casting this, the, he, he's painting this portrait with words. Oftentimes people complain about John because you, you can't tell. Sometimes you, you say, when did, the, when, did, when did a quote from Christ stop? And when did the narrative begin? Or when did, when, you know, and it kind of just blend, because John isn't trying to be, he put quotation marks around everything. What he's doing is he's painting a word picture that really just flows, the events flow into the doctrine and the doctrine into the events. Verse number 11, Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. Now, you, you, you have to appreciate what she's doing. Uh, she, uh, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. She, after Peter and John left, you know, she, she came, she sees the stone rolled away, the other women are there. She ran immediately to get Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved. They, they came and ran back. We saw how they go in and see the, the stuff. She came back with them. Then they, verse 10 says, the disciples went away unto their own house. They go back to John's house. Now, sometimes people see, you, you, you hear preachers say, well, see, they were indifferent. They didn't care. I, I showed you last time who was living at John's house. Chapter 19, that's Jesus said to, uh, to John, uh, to the disciple whom Jesus loved at, 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 the, at the cross. He says, behold your mother. One, behold your son. And from that hour, that disciple took the mother of Jesus to his own house. So not only was Peter living with him, he had Mary living with him. So when they go back, he goes back, they go back to, you know, to the house there. They're going back, at least they go back to tell Mary what's going on. It isn't necessarily such an indictment of their indifference. They realize something's happened. They realize there's a miracle taking place. They've seen the evidence of it. They don't know the scriptural basis of it. They just know something dramatic has happened. Mary has come back. She stays at the tomb. And she's weeping. Now, when I read that, I, I think immediately, the angel said to the women, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, he's risen. Now, that's the, great, that's the great testimony of the empty tomb. The thing that takes away the sting and the sorrow of death is the empty tomb. He's not here, he's risen. So the very thing that that should have caused rejoicing for Mary doesn't cause any, it causes weeping because she doesn't have any idea, any anticipation of, or any hope for a resurrection. You have to understand the record is so clear in these incidental things. They were not preaching that Jesus was going to die for their sins, be buried and raised again the third day. They don't even, it doesn't even register in their mind. That's why verse 9 says, As yet they knew not the scripture, that he should rise again from the dead. Even though he had begun to tell them that, they still didn't get it. So at this point, the fact that he's resurrected hasn't entered into Mary's mind. So she's brokenhearted, and she's weeping. And she wept. As she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. Now, what she should have seen in the sepulcher should have told her something miraculous had happened. But evidently, she's in the emotional state she's in. She's going to, well, she's going to look. Peter and the disciple look, so she's going to look. If you're going to walk by faith, you're going to wind up where she's at right here. Or if you're going to walk by sight, rather. Where should she have looked? Do you remember that great verse? I, I remember as a... I have, two, I have two memories of being 10 years old in Sunday school. One was being made to stand outside of the Sunday school class because I was misbehaving. And the other was learning Psalm 121. You ever learned that? I will lift up mine eyes to the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. You never learned that psalm? You ought to learn Psalm 121. That's a great psalm to learn. Mary would have known that psalm. And, it, it, and what should have been better off, lifting up her eyes to the hills from whence cometh her help, looking to the Lord, instead of looking at circumstances. But grief had overtaken her. So she looks into the sepulcher, 
And see what, look at what she sees. And seeth two angels in white sitting on the one hand, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Now, Peter and the disciple didn't see the angels. They were there, but they didn't see them. Now, if you go to Luke chapter 24, you'll see the women see two men. Angels in the Bible are men, have the appearance of men. They see the two. They they see the two men. They see the two men. They're outside of the two, uh, of the sepulcher, not 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 in it like, like Mary sees them in it, but they they they, they see them outside. And uh, they see them standing. Mary gets to see them in a very special way. They're sitting. Now, if if if, if you come with me to Psalm ninety one. Here's, here's the importance of these angels. And here's, I, I don't know why the disciples didn't see them. Well, I know why they didn't. The angels didn't appear to them. Angels can appear and disappear. They can be visible and invisible. They can manifest themselves so that a person can see them. They can cloak themselves so a person can't see them. When Peter and, and the disciple that Jesus loved went into the tomb, they didn't see the angels. They were there. But they didn't see them. The angels didn't, didn't choose to reveal themselves. So they didn't want anything to, to distract from the physical evidence. They saw the, they saw the clothes where the body of Jesus lay. Now you learn here, Mary sees the angels at either end of, of, of the, where the body laid. How would she know where the body laid? There, there's the grave clothes laying right there. And the angels on either end. Peter and, and John don't see them. Mary does. Now what were the angels doing? Angels would, would manifest the presence of God. Angels in the Bible are, 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 are messengers from God. They're proof that God was there working. And what he was doing is he, he was protecting and making sure no, no wicked hands mess with the body of the Lord Jesus Christ or with the evidence of his resurrection. Psalm 91 Verse number 9. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in thy ways. They shall bear thee up in, the, in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder and the young lion and, and, and the dragon, and shalt, uh, the dragon shalt uh, trample under feet. Now that's one of the psalms that is prophetically talking about the nation Israel and God's protection for the nation Israel. But that psalm is quoted in Matthew chapter 5 as a reference directly to the Lord Jesus Christ, Israel's Messiah. First of all, that's a promise to the Messiah that he would give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all. That, by the way, that's not a promise for you and me today. God never promised to give his angels charge over you to keep you in your way so you didn't dash your foot. The other, other night, my wife got up, walked across the bedroom, and she goes, Ow! And she'd stumped her toe in the end of the dresser. Now, I didn't get up and quote that verse and say, See, you're not living right. God didn't send where, where the I didn't do that. I know better than that. I've, seen, I've heard people do that kind of foolishness. That verse is a verse talking about God's protection, first for the Messiah, and second for the believing remnant who are in the Messiah. And it extends to them because they're in Christ. So when Mary sees the angel, there's a... You remember in Luke 23 when Jesus is in the garden and he's praying and he sweats his sweat drops like blood. The next verse says that God sent angels to minister to him. He had attendance when he said, I could call 10,000. The Father would send. They were there attendance for him. 
We sing that song, he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free, but he died alone for you and me. Wasn't because he had to. And so here at his resurrection, after he's, he's left the tomb, the angels come, they roll away the stone so people can see that he's gone, and then two angels sit. This is the only time in the scripture I can remember angels sitting, by the way. Most of the time they're standing. The ministering spirit sent forth to minister to them, the heirs of salvation. They don't sit. They don't rest. They go work. Here are two angels resting, sitting. That's important. They're sitting there where his body had laid. They're a testimony to the impact of the work, the finished work, and the resurrection victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just their posture is important. There's two of them, by the way. Two is a number of witness in the Bible. But you see where they're sitting? One is sitting at the head, and the other at the feet. Now, if you go back with me just for a second to the book of Exodus, you'll see some of the, the symbolism here, the typology. Exodus 25. Now, you've got to know the rest of the story to look back at this, but when John wrote this, he knew the rest of the story. Okay? And what it tells you is that whoever orchestrated those angels to be there, they knew not only the book of Exodus, but they knew the rest of the story that Exodus was pointing to when Moses wrote Exodus and didn't know what he was pointing to. Which is another one of those testimonies to the fact that whoever wrote Exodus had to know the future, had to know things that were going to happen in the future thousands of years later that it wasn't possible to know until after they'd happened and later on God told you what they meant. So the one that wrote these things had to be God himself. Exodus 25, verse number... In Exodus 25, Moses is being instructed by God about building the tabernacle. Verse, 24, verse 17, Exodus 25, 17, Thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt take, make two cherubims of gold. Of beaten work thou, uh, shalt thou make them in two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherubim on, the, on one end, and the other cherub on the other end, even of the mercy seat, shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. What they did is they took one big slab of gold. Now, the, the Ark of the Covenant was an ark, like, like a little cedar chest. It had a lid on it where you could eep, open it up. On that lid, you took, they, they took a, a big slab of gold, one slab, not, not just one big piece of gold, and out of it, they fashioned that lid... And at one end, they fashioned a cherubim. And at the other end, they fashioned a cherubim. Cherubim are creatures in the angelic world. They're not angels, but they're in that spirit world. The cherubim on this end looked down at the mercy seat. The cherubim on that end looked down at the mercy seat. Verse 22. Verse 21. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark, above upon the ark, on the top of it, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there, right on that mercy seat, will I meet with thee. I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. On that mercy seat where that high priest once a year would go in and sprinkle blood. In that ark, there, was a, there were the broken commandments, the, the, the two tables of stone that Moses got from God, wrote with his own finger. First time God wrote with his finger, he wrote those ten commandments. When he brought, came down off that mountain, you remember? The children of Israel were having a hoot nanny, and Moses broke them. Went back up, got new, a new set, came down, put them in there. There was, the, there was the 
Aaron's rod that budded, when, they, when Israel denied the authority of God. Then there was the pot of manna when they murmured against the... Everything in that ark testified to man's failure and God's provision in light of man's failure. So you've got the, the broken law, you've got the rebellion of man, you've got the, 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 the uh, disrespect of God's authority, and God's going to meet on that mercy seat and commune with them. So they would come in once a year and they would sprinkle blood on that mercy seat, the Day of Atonement. And it's fascinating in Leviticus 16, that high priest represents God, would come and he'd take his finger, the next time the finger of God shows up, and he would take his finger in the, in the blood of that, of that bullock. And he, the bullock, on the mercy seat, they didn't, you, didn't, you didn't use the blood of a lamb or a goat. You used the blood of a bullock. The bullock was the largest animal that they, that they used in a sacrifice. It's a picture of the, of, the, of, the, of the largeness, the wholeness of what Christ did. And they would take that blood and with one finger, one time, put the blood on that mercy seat. Once. Because it only takes once, and for, once for all. Then he would take his finger and take that blood. He'd back up and seven times he would drop it on the ground right in front of that ark. And I used to think, what in the world? Once on the mercy seat and seven times on the ground. Then it dawned on me. Seven is a number of completeness. Who's standing on the blood down here? The high priest. It only took once, one shedding of the blood, to provide a complete, perfect standing for Israel. So there's wonderful typology. Now you, you understand what you, I'm, I'm, you, the type, you, you, you understand what we know now about the cross work. You can see all of the, the fulfillment of all of that. When Mary comes in here, there's the place where Jesus lay. And there are the two angels standing there. And it was as though the type, here is the real, true meeting place between God and Israel and God and man. It's going to be in the work that Jesus Christ accomplished and finished where his body had lain. It isn't there anymore. It's in his finished work that God and man are brought back together. As a testimony, them, them sitting there is a testimony to the, to the rest that was secured. And you notice it says that they were in white. Nothing is lost there. White in the scripture is a picture of purity. These two angels were not, they're one sitting at the head, one sitting at the foot. And they aren't arguing about who's sitting where. Have you ever noticed how we do that? We'd rather be at the head than at the foot. We'd rather have the glory than the service. And they're completely and totally, there's no striving for place. They're just resting. He's not here. He's risen. Now Mary sees all that. She doesn't take in all that. But when I read that, I say, you know, John, when God orchestrated all that for John to record, he knew the end of the story. And all through John, I've been trying to point out to you these fascinating little things <laughs> that just kind of weave together this fabric that demonstrate the one they're talking about couldn't be anybody but who he was, and that's God. The Word became flesh. And though he came to his own, and his own received him not, to those that received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. And that's what goes on here. Now we're going to stop there because the time's gone. So we made it down through verse number 12. Okay, so we'll start in verse 13 next time. All right. Okay, I wrote on the sheet in there that we're going to make it down through verse 18, so I guess I lied. 
Our God and Father, we thank you tonight for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the marvels of your grace to us in him. We just pray that our hearts might rejoice in Christ our Savior.